Have you ever wondered how property professionals do their research? Well, wonder no more, because today I chat with Kate Forbes, who's going to give us a very detailed explanation of what research the team at Metropole does. So if you're interested in finding properties that are going to outperform the market, today's show is just for you. So welcome to this week's episode of the Michael Yardney podcast. Are you interested in property investing, success or money? Well, you're in the right place. This is the Michael Yardney podcast, where each week you'll learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment and money in 20 minutes or less. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect and pass on your wealth through strategic property advice. Now he's your host, Michael Yardney, who has once again been voted Australia's leading property investment advisor. That's the fourth time he's won a similar award in the last six years. How do you research property markets like the professionals do? Well, that was a question left on our website by Norell. And I can understand that it's sometimes difficult for people to know where to start and what data is important and what's not. I can see how with so much jargon and information, researching property markets can leave you umming and ahhing. Unfortunately, the most research many property investors do involves finding a property they fall in love with and then clicking a few websites to try and confirm the decision that they've already made. On the other hand, sophisticated investors take a strategic approach to research to make their investment results consistent and reproducible. The aim of this, of course, is to stop emotions creeping in. Well, today we're going to try and demystify this, so by the end of the show, you're going to have a better understanding of the research process undertaken by Kate Forbes, National Director of Property Strategy at Metropole, and her research team. Now, Kate's got over 20 years of investment experience in financial markets in two continents. She's qualified in many disciplines, including real estate, and she's also a CFA. Kate works really closely with me and oversees the national team of property strategists, Metropole, and the research team. Welcome, Kate. Thanks very much, Michael. Well, you've heard Narelle's question. So how does a property professional research the properties they buy to find ones that outperform the market? Firstly, I'd just like to say thanks very much, Narelle. It's a great question. Um, Well done for writing in on that. Uh, Before I actually answer your and Michael's question there, I just want to say it may just be that I'm biased, but I actually believe that it's the strategy that comes first. That makes a lot of sense because a lot of people go off and buy a property to fit in with what they'd like to do without actually thinking where they want to be. They don't plan to become the person they plan to become. Well, it depends. And you're right, Michael, and on entirely what you're actually trying to achieve. If it's consistent outperformance on capital growth, which is actually what we at Metropole prefer, then that's going to pay a large part in how you go about researching and ultimately choosing what you add into your portfolio. When you're looking for that consistent outperformance, you need to look for where what drives that growth is most often found. So we've done many podcasts, and I believe my listeners, Kate, understand the concept that I believe residential real estate is a high growth, relatively low yield investment. And to outperform the averages, to get the financial independence that most investors never get, your job, first of all, is to build an asset base. And the only way you can do that is through capital growth. So how do you choose a property that's going to outperform when there's so many properties around Australia and so many for sale at any one time? Well, we use two of your approaches, Michael. <laughs> the first being the top-down approach, because it's um, it's really important to start with the macro and, and then drill right down from there into the micro details of each property. So long before you choose the type of property, you need to nar- narrow down the locations that are going to work. And 80% of the hard work on capital growth will come from location. So this is obviously where you're going to um, need to focus. The top-down approach does that by starting with the big picture, being the, the macroeconomic fundamentals and drilling down from, from there. And because they are the fundamentals, they obviously change much more slowly than you, than you would be the case um with, with some of the other factors that play in. So the top-down approach obviously starts with the, the economy. We 
tend to focus, though, um, only on the major capital cities and perhaps even narrow that down to the four major capital cities because that's where the consistency of um, economic growth and multiple economic pillars is going to come from. So that's your jobs growth, your wage growth and your population growth. Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane and Perth. Well, when you think about it, most people look at the news each day, look at the auction results, see what's happened and look at the past. And I know when a number of years ago we changed our strategy to look for the future, to see where economic growth is going to be, where jobs growth is going to be, where population is going to be, so that that's going to actually create a demand for more properties. That very much changed the results for ourselves and for our clients and has helped us ride the ups and downs of the cycle, but more importantly, find properties that are going to outperform the averages. So you're right, we don't live in real estate in isolation. It has a lot to do with the Australian and the world macroeconomic concepts. So you're right, we drill down to the capital cities because that's where the majority of the population growth and the jobs growth is. What's next, Kate? Well, it isn't clearly the whole city that performs as well as each other. Those averages that you look at are just that. They are averages and there are suburbs that have significantly outperformed other suburbs. And not just that, but they do it consistently. So what we look at when we're looking at a suburb level is um, the suburbs that have high disposable income. It really isn't social commentary. It's just looking for where the residents can afford to keep pushing up the, the prices. It's important to note that we aren't looking for areas of affordability, of which there are many, in, in, even in Sydney and Melbourne, which um, are notoriously unaffordable. But they're affordable, and that brings with it a lack of scarcity. Rather, what we're looking for is where the residents can afford and that's because they have reasonable disposable income and that, that ability to afford is what pushes up the, the prices. That's a really subtle but an important distinction. We're not looking for properties that are affordable to everybody. We're looking for areas where people have got a high disposable income and can afford to, but more importantly, are prepared to pay a premium. So how do we find those? Well, it's quite easy because the census data actually breaks down uh, suburbs, and it's very easy to see those areas that have outperformed with regard to wages growth. The last census data showed that some suburbs had up to 40-50% more wages growth than the average for that city. That's very, very interesting. Indeed it is, and those are obviously the suburbs that you want to, to target. So we start with the macro level, how's the economy going, where's there going to be economic growth, then we drill down to the suburb level of which suburbs are likely to do better because the residents there, the demographics, makes it more likely that people are going to have more disposable income. What next? Well... Drilling down from there, it's not the whole suburb that works. And if you think about the suburb that you live in at the moment, there are pockets of it that are perhaps more desirable than other pockets of it. And which areas do you think will have the most consistent capital growth? It's obviously going to be the ones that are consistently more desirable. So we need to um, pin down those streets or those particular little areas in a suburb that... Um, are quieter, leafier. So we're, we're not talking about main roads here. Now that's really interesting because in a lot of our suburbs, there's development happening. It's happening in particular along the main roads. They're building new shops and above them, above them apartments. And we tend to avoid those. Not that we mind that new development. I think it actually enhances the suburb. So you want to be close to, but not too close to all this development. So rather than by on the main road where the shops are now doing better. There's more people living there. There's more people out in the streets, shopping, uh, eating in the restaurants. So that makes the suburbs more vibrant. But you want to be close enough, but far enough away not to be bothered by it. You want to be um, near the train line, but not so that you can actually hear it. <laughs> well said. <laughs> That's right. So we've broken it down then to within the suburb. There are subsections of the suburb and even Different ends of the street will sometimes make a difference. So what next as we drill down? 
just before that in in Sydney, it might be what side of the street. Actually, in your school zones as well, that can um, have a very large impact. So if you cross the street, you're out of the school zone. But um, in the school zone, huge premium, and that has a massive impact upon your long-term capital growth. In Brisbane, often at one end of the street, you can, or one side of the street, you can pull down a house and redevelop it and in another area even right next door because of the heritage listing you can't so that's right you've got to become an area expert well we'll chat about this later i'm sure but this is um why you would focus very much after you have pinned down your locations on choosing um, a buyer's agent who is an expert in the area and can cut through all of those risks for you Sure, you can do all the research on the internet. You can do a lot of the info, get a lot of the information about suburbs and growth and demographics, but you can't get, I guess, the perspective. That's something that it takes years to do, and that's why we at Metropole don't employ um, enthusiastic amateurs. We've got very experienced buyers agents who understand why some areas do much better than others. But let's keep drilling down with the top-down approach, Kate. Okay, so you've identified the suburbs and the and the the streets and the areas that are going to work. You now need to focus on what is the right type of property. For example, are houses more in demand in that area, or is it largely apartments or or flats or smaller and more, more compact style of, of properties that are more in demand? Um, for example, Sydney has, has built more apartments than homes every year since the 1990s. And people are used to living in, in apartments there. Melbourne, less so, but we're coming along. We came along to the party in 2010, where since then we, we now build more apartments than homes. But in other states, it's still homes that are more um, in demand and more constructed. So it's important to make sure that you have a property type that appeals to the broadest number of people. That's not only going to make sure it's in demand by tenants, but crucially, it's going to be what drives what your capital growth going forward as well. Well, I guess that means you shouldn't discount apartments or flats, but it depends where. Well-located properties with, I guess, a high land to asset ratio are going to work well. I guess your budget's going to be one of the important factors, isn't it, Kate? It's a big player, and that's something that you can't um, change too much. It's set by the banks, but you you definitely do not compromise on location in order to get um, a bigger block of land, for example, or more building for your buck. I guess there's something that in reading in between the lines that you said, when we choose a property, there are three things we've got to play with. One is the budget, and as you said, that's set by the banks. Two is location, and you clearly said we don't compromise on that. And three is the property, so you've got to get the right property, the best property you can afford in that location. Now that we've identified the right suburb, Kate, how do we choose the best property that's going to make an investment grade property? Because as we've already discussed, not all properties are investment grade. It's another one of your approaches, Michael, which we call the six-step strategic approach. And it begins with only buying properties that would appeal to owner-occupiers. Not because selling is part of the strategy or the plan, but because in buying properties that are similar to what other owner-occupiers would purchase, they push up local real estate values. And this is going to be particularly important in 2018, as the percentage of investors in the market is likely to diminish. That makes sense. And in fact, in the long term, it's always going to be important also. So number one is you buy a property with owner-occupier appeal. Number two, we only buy properties that are at or below intrinsic value. And that's why we avoid off-the-plan properties, which both come at a premium price and they also introduce more risk. Right. Thirdly, we're going to only buy in an area that has that long history of strong capital growth and that will continue to outperform the averages because of the demographics in the area as we've already discussed. Next. Then we're going to look for a property that has a twist or um, something unique or special or different about the the property, Um, something that's perhaps a, a little bit scarce. And then we would, fifthly, is that a word? We would look to to buy a property where we can manufacture capital growth through refurbishment, renovations, or um, redevelopment. 
I guess it's even more important at this stage of the cycle where the market isn't going to do as much of the heavy lifting. So if you buy a property to which you can add value through renovations or refurbishments, as you said, that'll allow you to manufacture some capital growth. And even if you can't do it straight away, if your budget doesn't allow it, buying that sort of property means that the potential will never be taken away and you can add to it later. It's also something that um, is is particularly important since the changes to the uh, budget last year, that unless you have added that value yourself, you can't claim the depreciation on it. That's a really good point. So if somebody's done all the hard work for you, uh, in the old days, that was pretty good because you could get the benefit from depreciation, but you don't now. Now, another thing that many investors don't realise is if you do it straight away, that's not necessarily a tax deduction it's a capital cost you can depreciate it but the renovations aren't seen as a tax deduction absolutely but your ability to renovate never goes away sure it's like a free option (laughs) it's a good way of saying (laughs) um then the sixth part of the six step strategic approach is um that we're looking for something that has a high land to asset value ratio For example, you wouldn't want to buy a $500,000 house where the land was only valued at $150,000, for example. Um, We all know that it's the land that appreciates. So you want a high proportion of the price that you've paid to be attributed to the land rather than to the building. I guess that's one of the reasons we don't like buying in outer areas or regional areas where the land is abundant But because it's abundant, it's also not as scarce, I guess, and therefore not as expensive. So even in an apartment building, the older flats that we like to buy in, there's an attributable land value, a tenth, an eighth, a twelfth of uh, you own under the block of apartments. Of course, in those new big high-rise buildings, you own one two hundredth, and that's why we avoid those. So first of all, we do the top-down approach and find the right area, and then we choose the right area using the six-stranded strategic approach. But Kate, you've left out price. It's right at the bottom of the list for a reason. It's far more important to buy a good asset at the right price than a bad asset at a good price. I guess you make your money when you buy a property by buying well, not by buying cheaply. And that's where some investors get it wrong. Cheap in a property that's not popular today is not going to be popular in five years' time either. A couple of years ago when the market was booming, every property went up. There was the fear of missing out and everything sold. But now people with A-grade properties, A-grade homes, investment-grade properties are selling well, but secondary properties are not. And that's a lesson one has to learn. You've really got to select investment-grade assets. Kate, I guess the question our listeners may be wondering is, where do we get all the data for that research? So maybe I could explain that while some of the data is available for free on the internet, uh, you can go to real estate common domain, you can dig down and you can see days on market, you can see uh, how many properties are for sale, you can see what's going on. That's now freely available. What creates the edge is to be able to, first of all, interpret it, because when there's so much data it's hard to interpret but you need another layer of data so we buy and it costs a significant amount of money but it's important for us uh, research data from core logic um, from uh, the australian bureau of statistics we get a lot of data we buy data from australian property monitors from risk wise there are many data sources that our research team look at and then put together but i guess the big difference is being able to interpret it, and that's not easy because a lot of us have confirmation bias. Searching is not the same as researching. So people search for a property and they they find something to suit their needs, or they think they suit their needs, or suit their predetermined ideas, and that's not necessarily the case. The other thing is people say, well, I don't need that. I know my local area. That's why I'll buy there. But understanding the neighbourhood is not the same as understanding the market. Here you may understand uh, where the shops are, where the school zones are, but that's very, very different to understanding the depth of the market. And it's this time of the cycle, Kate, where, where, where the market is no longer performing as strongly and in many areas prices are falling a bit. It's really interesting to go back 15, 20 years to see how individual suburbs have performed during the ups and downs. Some are more stable, some are more volatile. So one of the areas we look at is how have suburbs performed 
during 2010, 11, 12, when interest rates went up, 2008, 9, during the global financial crisis, 2002, 3, when the market was flat again for a while, and even way back to the 1990s. That gives some insights uh, into how they're more likely to perform as the market changes. So when choosing a suburb, is there any other data that you look at, Kate? Sure, there's actually um, a bit of free data that you can get off the realestate.com or domain um, to look at market depth in particular. Um, now, that's a term I know you've come from a, a CFA background that's often used in the stock market where some shares are traded in huge volume, so you can always sell, and there's others that are very lightly traded, and sometimes you're stuck. In property, it's really much the same. What you want to see is is multiple buyers out there. So so that if the bidder to go back to the stock market um, disappears, are there a number standing behind it in the queue looking to to purchase? Right. So in suburb research, you look at market depth. What else do you look for? Days on market. How long are those properties sitting on the market before somebody snaps them up? Vendor discounting is another thing we look at as well. In other words, what vendors' expectations are and how much they have to drop it to make a sale. And we also look for auction clearance rates. In those areas, particularly Melbourne, Sydney, and to a lesser extent Brisbane, where auctions are important, because it gives you a good barometer of market sentiment. You don't want to see a lot of properties being passed in. Currently, auction clearance rates are less than they were a year ago, and people are a bit worried about that. But when they were 80%, that was boom conditions. At the moment, they're in the 60s and 70s. I'd be a little bit concerned when they drop closer to 50%. That's usually the tipping point for a buyer's market rather than the seller's market. Now, Kate, during our conversation a minute ago, you made a comment about why it would make sense to use a buyer's agent to represent you considering there's so much data, so much research, so much interpretation necessary. Do you want to add a bit further to that? Well, choosing the buyer's agent should actually be um, a necessary part. And again, I might well be biased, but it's the last step of the, the process. You might well, as Michael said, um, know of an area um, and not necessarily understand the, the market. But that area where you live, for example, might not be what strategically actually works for you. So um, you then need that micro level expertise from um, somebody. And um, we'd suggest that that should be a buyer's agent who spent their entire career in real estate in those suburbs. So we don't um, believe in fly in, fly out buyer's agents. You have to have somebody who's on the ground um, and, and as I said, spent their entire careers there um, because what you don't want is to, to have an unnecessary bias towards an, an area that doesn't suit your strategy. So before you have a bias agent, you actually need a strategist. What's the difference? Well, before you get to a bias agent, the strategist needs to pinpoint and, and formulate your strategy from a holistic perspective. The buyer's agent is an order taker. Now, someone will get offended by that, Kate. Not at all. They, they should have, a, and they do have, an incredible level of expertise at that micro level to be able to select the properties within that strategy that are going to perform. But a property strategist looks more holistically at the picture and, and whether your ownership structures and your finance structures are correct and is what you're embarking upon aligned with the goals that you're trying to achieve. When all of that's been lined up, that's when you hand over to a buyer's agent, for example, in Brisbane or Sydney or Melbourne, depending on what that strategy is, to fulfill the brief. Right. So strategy first, property research. If you can't do it yourself, in fact, it's almost impertinent to think you can do it yourself compared to somebody who's in the market all day, every day, getting a good perspective, having opportunity for off-market properties. And while I think some people may see it as a cost, I know many of our clients initially felt 
boy, that's expensive. But when they've actually found the right sort of property that fits their lifestyle, that gives them the choices in life, that fits their risk profile, that outperforms the averages, they've seen the cost of a buyer's agent as an investment rather than an expense. You've given us a lot of great information, Kate. Anything else you'd like to share before we finish off our session today? Yeah, I think it's important to to have a, a look at the number of new properties that are um, coming out every year and the, the properties changing hands every year. Um, most are not investment grade. They're just investment stock. Putting into perspective, there's about 500,000 properties a year that are transacted. 70% are owner-occupiers um, and about 30% to investors. But as you said, I agree with you, most are not investment grade. Investment stock is very, very different. They're built for investors. And as you said a bit earlier in our session today, investment grade are really more the owner-occupier style. And what that sort of property is, whether it's an apartment, a house, a villa unit, a townhouse, will really depend upon local demographics. So there isn't one style of investment property. No, um, many a apartment that is well located and well selected has have outperformed houses that are in poor locations or are poorly selected. So it really is important not to fixate on a particular property type, but to um, work through the top down and the six stranded strategic approach and actually answer all of those questions. Uh, it may well be an apartment that is your outperformer. Thank you for the great insight, Kate. And if people want to have a chat with you or your team, just go to metropole.com.au and they'll have a chance to uh, find out a bit more about what you do and how to contact you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, that's almost it for another show. But because there was so much spoken about and so much detail, I've got two suggestions. First of all, go to the show notes at michaeliartneypodcast.com and I've got some links to some articles about property research so that you can learn more about this. And why not listen to this again, maybe at one and a half times speed? You'll still get the great information, but uh, you'll get through it quicker. I'd also like to read out a review I received today. And remember, anyone who sends me a review and I read it out on the show is going to get a copy of a book. This time it was from Peter Rolls, 82. So Peter, send me an email at michael at metropole.com.au and I will give you a book of your choice. I'll put it in the mail to you. Peter says, tells it how it is. Very informative. He left a five-star review saying, I learn something every time I tune in. It's all about the mindset. And you're right, Peter, that's one of the major differentiators between successful investors and the average Australian. Having said that, we didn't discuss any mindset today because there just wasn't time. So I look forward to showing you some new ideas about money, success and property when we catch up this time next week. And let's see if I've got a mindset moment for you then. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Michael Yardney podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property advice. If you got value from listening to this podcast, please leave us a review and we'll read it out on a future show. Just go to michaelyardneypodcast.com forward slash review and it will take you over to iTunes where you can enter a review and let us know what you think. We'd really appreciate it. If you don't already subscribe on iTunes or on your Android phone, you'll find us there as Michael Yardney Podcast. If you'd like to gain instant access to the show notes or a transcript of the show, head across to michaelyardneypodcast.com. Watch out for our show next week. You learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 20 minutes.